Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm an assistant professor of clinical sciences at Keck Graduate Institute, and today we will be discussing erectile dysfunction. The reason we're discussing this topic today is because erectile dysfunction affects many male patients, particularly those of older age. And when a patient develops erectile dysfunction, it can affect not only their love lives and um, sexual well-being, um, but it can affect their overall mentality and overall well-being as well. Um, so our learning objectives are here today. So we're going to um, explain anatomy and physiology of male sexual function and performance. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, erection and physiological effects of erection. Um, we'll discuss types of erectile dysfunction. We're going to talk and describe the causes of diminished sexual interest and activity. Um, including most common causes of ED, um, particularly how medications and medical conditions can affect um, libido and sexual activity and ED, and how testosterone also has an effect there. Um, we're going to talk about medications um, and non-pharmacological recommendations regarding ED, including mechanisms of action, adverse reactions and drug interactions, contraindications for different ED products. And we're also going to recommend appropriate interventions for treatment of ED for um, patients' um, specific situations. Um, for exam purposes, we probably will be focusing on these last four objectives, starting with describe the types of erectile dysfunction and recommend appropriate interventions for the treatment of ED for specific patients. So basically the last four are the ones that we will focus on mostly for testing purposes, just an FYI. And back to our case of BD. So our Caucasian male, 45 years old, who was concerned about his sexual performance. He's been dating his current partner for three months, has no problems with libido, uh, cannot become erect for sexual activity. Um, he has no past medical history and his vital signs are stable. So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, it does say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, the patient still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that, because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, it does say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, the patient still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, it does say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, the patient still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that, because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. So a little bit of epidemiology and background about um, erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction increases men, men age, and the incidence is low in men who are younger than 40, but increases in men who are 40 and above. There's about a 52% incidence reported in some studies in men who are 40 to 70 years old, and once men hit 70 years old, there's um, as high as an 80% incidence in erectile dysfunction. So this is a very, very important thing, especially if a male um, is sexually active. Um, they may experience this at some time during their lives, as they, particularly as they age. 
Um, a little bit of background about the anatomy and physiology of the penis. So the penis is actually made up of multiple parts. We have two corpora cavernosa on the dorsal side, um, which are basically these large areas, um, circular areas that you see here in the middle. We have one corpus spongiosum on the ventral side, which is this bottom portion here. Um, now, keep in mind that um, as males are normally functioning um, and their peanuts are flaccid or essentially flat, um, arterial and venous blood flow into and out of the penis are regularly normal. Um, however, when a, um, a male gets sexually stimulated and becomes erect, the corpora areas, so the corpora cavernosum and the corpora spongiosum, fill with arterial blood, and this causes the penis to elongate and swell. And that is essentially what happens during an erection. Also during an erection, the venous outflow of blood is decreased from this area, and that basically causes the erection to be um, prolonged for longer than a few seconds to a few minutes. Um, so during this process, arterial blood flows in, venous blood is, um, venous outflow is minimized. Um, um, a little bit of background about the anatomy and physiology of the penis. So the penis is actually made up of multiple parts. We have two corpora cavernosa on the dorsal side. Um, which are basically these large areas, um, circular areas that you see here in the middle. We have one corpus spongiosum on the ventral side, which is this bottom portion here. Um, now, keep in mind that um, as males are normally functioning um, and their peanuts are flaccid or essentially flat, um, arterial and venous blood flow into and out of the penis are regularly normal. Um, however, when a, um, a male gets sexually stimulated and becomes erect, the corpora areas, so the corpora cavernosum and the corpora spongiosum, fill with arterial blood, and this causes the penis to elongate and swell. And that is essentially what happens during an erection. Also during an erection, the venous outflow of blood is decreased from this area, and that basically causes the erection to be um, prolonged for longer than a few seconds to a few minutes. Um, so during this process, arterial blood flows in, venous blood is, um, venous outflow is minimized. Um, um, a little bit of background about the anatomy and physiology of the penis. So the penis is actually made up of multiple parts. We have two corpora cavernosa on the dorsal side, um, which are basically these large areas, um, circular areas that you see here in the middle. We have one corpus spongiosum on the ventral side, which is this bottom portion here. Um, now, keep in mind that um, as males are normally functioning um, and their peanuts are flaccid or essentially flat, um, arterial and venous blood flow into and out of the penis are regularly normal. Um, however, when a, um, a male gets sexually stimulated and becomes erect, the corpora areas, so the corpora cavernosum and the corpora spongiosum, fill with arterial blood, and this causes the penis to elongate and swell. And that is essentially what happens during an erection. Also during an erection, the venous outflow of blood is decreased from this area, and that basically causes the erection to be um, prolonged for longer than a few seconds to a few minutes. Um, so during this process, arterial blood flows in, venous blood is, um, venous outflow is minimized. Um, um, some other factors that we need to consider whenever we consider erection, um, as well as ejaculation and erectile dysfunction in general is that, um, when a patient develops an erection, a lot of the, 
um, dilation is actually acetylcholine mediated and this is done through nitric oxide production remember nitric oxide is a vasodilator and this vasodilation will increase arterial blood flow into the corporeal areas of the penis. There are also other transmitters that help with the vasodilatory effects such as CGMP, CAMP, CAMP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide and prostaglandin E. Um, and these are important just to know about and be aware of because a lot of these can actually be targets that we can use um, in terms of ED therapy, particularly prostaglandin. Um, Another thing that we have to consider whenever a patient um, is becoming erect is that they have to have the appropriate psychogenic stimuli present. So they have to basically be aroused. And if they have some kind of problem in becoming aroused, say whether it's because of a medication, a disease state, or, you know, even the relationship that they're currently in, because sometimes, you know, a patient may, you know, have sexual activity with someone who they might not actually be, you know, um, stimulated by. In those cases, psychogenic stimuli play a role in the erection um, and then the eventual um, sexual activity of that patient. Also, hormonal systems play a role here too, um, particularly with the male testosterone plays a role, and that is another target of drug therapy that we may be particularly concerned about with erectile dysfunction. If testosterone levels are low and libido of the patient is low, we might um, target that pathway through giving testosterone replacement. So in terms of etiology of erectile dysfunction, we've talked about a little bit or alluded to some of these already, but etiology of erectile dysfunction is divided into two different sets. Organic erectile dysfunction, which is about 80% of patients, and psychogenic erectile dysfunction, which is about 20% of patients. For organic erectile dysfunction, we are focused mainly on the vascular, neurologic, and hormonal um, etiologies of erectile dysfunction. So things in terms of vascular and peripheral vascular disease where blood can't flow properly arterial sclerosis, again, where blood cannot flow properly, and hypertension, again, where blood cannot flow properly. If blood can't flow properly into the penis, the penis will have a harder time becoming erect, particularly if these disease states are not well controlled. Just because a patient, though, has, you know, a disease state such as hypertension, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that a patient um, will have erectile dysfunction. If these disease states are well controlled, a patient can actually live a very fulfilling um, sexual life. Um, ad additionally, things such as neurologic factors play a role. So if a patient has stroke, spinal cord injury, or a very uncontrolled diabetes, for example, um, neuronal transmission to the penis to become erect will not be adequate. And when these patients, if they have enough damage neurologically, they may um, not be able to um, perform in the bedroom as they would like. Um, and then, as we alluded to earlier, hormonal um, causes of erectile dysfunction, um, such that where you get hypogonadism. And in some patients with certain types of hypogonadism, particularly testosterone deficiency, this can be again mediated by testosterone, assuming that their testosterone level is low and they have decreased libido. Um, in the other 20% of patients, we actually have psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And essentially what psychogenic erectile dysfunction is, is they don't have the psychogenic stimuli um, to develop an erection. So a patient may have some type of psych disorder or other mental health disorder. Um, they may be sedated. They may be um, just reactively depressed, um, such where you might actually have um, depression maybe from a substance such as alcohol. Um, or the patient may just have performance anxiety whenever the time comes to become um, sexually intimate with their partner. Um, it's important that we also factor in the psychogenic causes of erectile dysfunction because sometimes, um, obviously, disease states can play a role with this, but also medications may also have a role in causing psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And that is very important to note because if you can correct the psychogenic cause or minimize the psychogenic cause, you can get the, um, the patient performing how they would like again. 
So in terms of etiology of erectile dysfunction, we've talked about a little bit or alluded to some of these already, but etiology of erectile dysfunction is divided into two different sets. Organic erectile dysfunction, which is about 80% of patients, and psychogenic erectile dysfunction, which is about 20% of patients. For organic erectile dysfunction, we are focused mainly on the vascular, neurologic, and hormonal um, etiologies of erectile dysfunction. So things in terms of vascular and peripheral vascular disease where blood can't flow properly arterial sclerosis, again, where blood cannot flow properly, and hypertension, again, where blood cannot flow properly. Blood can't flow properly into the penis. The penis will have a harder time becoming erect, particularly if these disease states are not well controlled. Just because a patient, though, has, you know, a disease state such as hypertension, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that a patient um, will have erectile dysfunction. If these disease states are well controlled, a patient can actually live a very fulfilling um, sexual life. Um, ad additionally, things such as neurologic factors play a role. So if a patient has stroke, spinal cord injury, or very uncontrolled diabetes, for example, um, neuronal transmission to the penis to become erect will not be adequate. And when these patients, if they have enough damage neurologically, they may um, not be able to um, perform in the bedroom as they would like. Um, and then, as we alluded to earlier, hormonal um, causes of erectile dysfunction, um, such that where you get hypogonadism. And in some patients with certain types of hypogonadism, particularly testosterone deficiency, this can be again mediated by testosterone, assuming that their testosterone level is low and they have decreased libido. Um, in the other 20% of patients, we actually have psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And essentially what psychogenic erectile dysfunction is, is they don't have the psychogenic stimuli um, to develop an erection. So a patient may have some type of psych disorder or other mental health disorder. Um, they may be sedated. They may be um, just reactively depressed, um, such where you might actually have um, depression maybe from a substance such as alcohol. Um, or the patient may just have performance anxiety whenever the time comes to become um, sexually intimate with their partner. Um, it's important that we also factor in the psychogenic causes of erectile dysfunction because sometimes, um, obviously, disease states can play a role with this, but also medications may also have a role in causing psychogenic erectile dysfunction. And that is very important to note because if you can correct the psychogenic cause or minimize the psychogenic cause, you can get the, um, the patient performing how they would like again. In terms of diagnosis of erectile dysfunction, erectile dysfunction has to happen over a longer period of time. So we need to really assess sexual activity over the last one to six months. Um, a diagnosis can be made um, with assistance of a self-administered questionnaire such as the International Index of Erectile Dysfunction, also known as the IIEF. Um, there are short versions of the IIEF, such as the IIEF-5, which are composed of a shorter amount of questions than the standard International Index of Erectile Dysfunction, which composes many different questions. So, for example, with the IIEF-5, it's only made up of five questions. Higher scores indicate normal function of um, the penis and erection. If you have a lower score um, on the IIEF-5 scale, you um, are more likely to have some kind of etiology of erectile dysfunction um, with lower scores being more severe, as you see here. These scores, I will not necessarily have you um, know like what is mild and what is severe, but I just want you to be aware on the IIEF 5 that the lowest score of 5 is bad or the worst, and the highest score of 25 is normal. When assessing medication history, it's important to be aware about medications that may worsen BPH. Testosterone replacement um, may promote growth of the prostate tissue, as we discussed earlier. And obviously, if you have prostate growth tissue growth, um, that will basically eliminate the 
um, urinary flow and the ability of that urine to actually exit the body, um, worsening BPH symptoms. Oral or intranasal alpha agonists such as um, Sudafed or Sudafedrin, ephedrine, and phenylephrine may also worsen BPH by causing contraction of the prostate smooth muscle by activating those alpha-1 receptors that are on that smooth muscle causing contraction of that prostate. Beta agonist may cause um, bladder detrusor muscle relaxation preventing bladder emptying and an example of that is with terbutaline. Um, this in BPH actually can only um, help in cases where you actually have irritative voiding symptoms and we'll talk about that a little bit later with um, Merbetric. Anticholinergics may decrease contractility of the urinary bladder detrusor muscle and examples of those as we've discussed um, with the ED lecture include antihistamines and TCAs. In addition, we have diuretics that may worsen BPH um, by obviously causing polyurea. If patients are um, having increased urinary um, release, um, that obviously may um, be related to increased urinary frequency and frequent trips to the bathroom, which may present similar to BPH symptoms. And in a patient with BPH already, we don't want to worsen those symptoms. So obviously with diuretics, that's something that we just have to be aware about in the event that the benefit outweighs the risk to actually receive that diuretic in a patient who is receiving B um, or who has BPH. In terms of diagnosis of erectile dysfunction, erectile dysfunction has to happen over a longer period of time. So we need to really assess sexual activity over the last one to six months. Um, a diagnosis can be made um, with assistance of a self-administered questionnaire such as the International Index of Erectile Dysfunction, also known as the IIEF. Um, there are short versions of the IIEF, such as the IIEF-5, which are composed of a shorter amount of questions than the standard international index of erectile dysfunction, which composes many different questions. So, for example, with the IIEF-5, it's only made up of five questions. Higher scores indicate normal function of um, the penis and erection. If you have a lower score um, on the IIEF-5 scale, you um, are more likely to have some kind of etiology of erectile dysfunction um, with lower scores being more severe, as you see here. These scores, I will not necessarily have you um, know like what is mild and what is severe, but I just want you to be aware on the IIEF 5 that the lowest score of 5 is bad or the worst, and the highest score of 25 is normal. In terms of diagnosis of erectile dysfunction, erectile dysfunction has to happen over a longer period of time, so we need to really assess sexual activity over the last one to six months. Um, a diagnosis can be made um, with assistance of a self-administered questionnaire such as the International Index of Erectile Dysfunction, also known as the IIEF. Um, there are short versions of the IIEF, such as the IIEF-5, which are composed of a shorter amount of questions than the standard international index of erectile dysfunction, which composes many different questions. So, for example, with the IIEF-5, it's only made up of five questions. Higher scores indicate normal function of um, the penis and erection. If you have a lower score um, on the IIEF-5 scale, you um, are more likely to have some kind of etiology of erectile dysfunction um, with lower scores being more severe, as you see here. These scores, I will not necessarily have you um, know like what is mild and what is severe, but I just want you to be aware on the IIEF-5 that the lowest score of 5 is bad or the worst, and the highest score of 25 is normal. 
So our treatment goals in regards to erectile dysfunction are to improve quality and quantity of erection suitable for intercourse and the satisfactory performance as perceived by both the patient and their partner. And that and partner part is very important because um, even though the patient may be satisfied, their partner may not be. And this can lead to problems down the road in terms of um, relationships. So we have many different treatment options available for erectile dysfunction. We have both pharmacologic interventions that you see here, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors or the PDE5 inhibitors, testosterone replacement, prostaglandin such as alprostadil, oleohimbine, papaverine, and fentolamine. And then we have non-pharmacologic um, devices, um, including vacuum erection devices or VEDs and penile prosthesis. So, the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now, it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend hint, hint, star, star to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic ther therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we wanna treat any underlying diseases. So for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, or even the psychogenic um, related to these states or the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to just continue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you know you need to treat the underlying cause, but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause, then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, if your patient has hypogonadism, you need to give testosterone replacement. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone. So we have many different treatment options available for erectile dysfunction. We have both pharmacologic interventions that you see here, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors or the PDE5 inhibitors, testosterone replacement, prostaglandin such as alprostadil, oleohimbine, papaverine, and fentolamine. And then we have non-pharmacologic um, devices, um, including vacuum erection devices or VEDs and penile prosthesis. So the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend hint, hint, star, star to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic ther therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we want to treat any underlying diseases. So for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, or even the psychogenic 
um, related to these states are the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to discontinue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you know you need to treat the underlying cause but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy now if your patient has hypogonadism you need to give testosterone replacement um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone so those include sildenafil or viagra tadalafil or cialis vardenafil um, also known as Levitra or Staxin, depending on which formulation you have. Staxin is the um, ODT formulation, um, and Avanafil or Stendra. The reason why the ones that are bolded here are bolded is because these are the ones that are most commonly seen in clinical practice, and those are going to be the ones for testing purposes that I'm going to expect you to know. Um, now, obviously, I want you to still know that Avanafil is used for erectile dysfunction, but you don't need to necessarily know its brand name of Stendra. And I'll be honest, I haven't actually seen this actual drug in practice, but it does exist. Um, the PDE5 inhibitors are competitive reversible inhibitors of phosphodiesterase isoenzyme 5, and these are found, um, this isoenzyme is found in the genital tissue. Um, these agents are effective for about 60 to 70 percent of patients overall. Um, adverse effects of this class in general include headache, facial flushing, dyspepsia, nasal congestion, dizziness, hypotension, and priapism, which is essentially a prolong prolonged erection, although that is very rare. Um, an important point to make here, hint, hint, star, star, is that um, a contraindication to phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors is organic nitrate, so things such as nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, um, and also isosorbide formulations that can be taken for angina or heart failure, like isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. Um, if you do have a patient um, who is administered a PDE5 inhibitor or takes a PDE5 inhibitor, it's very important that we hold those nitrates for at least 24 hours after giving the PDE5 inhibitor. And the exception for this is Tadalafil or Cialis. We need to wait at least 48 hours after we give Tadalafil. And the reason why we hold um, nitrates for these patients is because of risk of hypotension concomitantly, because as you see, these agents are antihypertensive agents. And PDE5 inhibitors can cause hypotension, which um, can be potentially um, deadly for a patient and require a hospital admission. So those include sildenafil or Viagra, Tadalafil or Cialis, Vardenafil, um, also known as Levitra or Staxin, depending on which formulation you have. Staxin is the um, ODT formulation. Um, and Avanafil or Stendra. The reason why the ones that are bolded here are bolded is because these are the ones that are most commonly seen in clinical practice, and those are going to be the ones for testing purposes that I'm going to expect you to know. Um, now, obviously, I want you to still know that Avanafil is used for erectile dysfunction, but you don't need to necessarily know its brand name of Stendra. And I'll be honest, I haven't actually seen this actual drug in practice, but it does exist. Um, the PDE5 inhibitors are competitive reversible inhibitors of phosphodiesterase isoenzyme 5, and these are found, um, this isoenzyme is found in the genital tissue. Um, these agents are effective for about 60 to 70 percent of patients overall. Um, adverse effects of this class in general include headache, facial flushing, dyspepsia, nasal congestion, dizziness, hypotension, and priapism, which is essentially a prolong prolonged erection, although that is very rare. Um, an important point to make here, hint, hint, star, star, is that um, a contraindication to phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors is organic nitrate, so things such as nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, um, and also isosorbide formulations that can be taken for angina or heart failure, like isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. Um, if you do have a patient um, 
who is administered a PDE5 inhibitor or takes a PDE5 inhibitor, it's very important that we hold those nitrates for at least 24 hours after giving the PDE5 inhibitor. And the exception for this is Tadalafil or Cialis. We need to wait at least 48 hours after we give Tadalafil. And the reason why we hold um, nitrates for these patients is because of risk of hypotension concomitantly, because as you see, these agents are antihypertensive agents. And PDE5 inhibitors can cause hypotension, which um, can be potentially um, deadly for a patient and require a hospital admission. Um, in regards to the comparison of all these different agents, the bolded information is the information that I want you to focus on. Um, so I want you to focus on the starting doses. Usually um, it is advised to start low um, or on the lower end of the dosing range and go slow um, with these agents because obviously of the risk of side effects, particularly hypotension. Um, so with Viagra or Sildenafil, the starting dose is 25 to 50. For Tadalafil, it's 5 to 10. And for Vardenafil or Levitra, it is 10 milligrams um, typically. Though you could also go and start with um, 5 with Vardenafil as well, and that's not included on this slide, um, but that would be perfectly acceptable. Um, you see the doses ranges here. Typically for most of these agents, you're gonna probably take them between 30 minutes and one hour prior to intercourse. The duration of um, therapy of these agents ranges, and it's very important to note here. For sildenafil and vardenafil, they last about two to five hours or two to four hours, depending on which agent you have. Um, but however, for tadalafil, it can actually last up to 36 hours. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the patient has an erection for 36 hours. I wanna be very clear about that. Um, it doesn't mean that the patient is erect that whole period of time. It means that they have the capability of becoming erect during that time. So for Cialis, for example, Cialis might be a good agent if the patient just wants to take one tablet. And something I did not include in the slides is that you want to also consider cost with these medications. A lot of these medications are not covered by insurance for the purpose of erectile dysfunction, and as a result of that are very expensive, um, with some agents, you know, costing as much as $50 to $80 a tablet. Um, Cialis and Viagra, I believe, now cost in the ballpark probably of $20 to $30 a tablet. Um, so with Cialis specifically, because it can work up to 36 hours, um, it may be beneficial for patients who are maybe going like on a weekend trip, for example, and they only want to take one tablet um, if they plan on having intercourse. Um, in that case, they might be able to potentially um, develop multiple erections with just one tablet. Um, it's also important to be aware about whether to take food on or food with these medications. With Cialis, it's not necessary. Um, with Sildenafil and Vardenafil, however, these should be taken on an empty stomach um, to promote absorption and overall action of the medication. So the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide, um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend, hint, hint, star, star, to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic therapy, therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we want to treat any underlying diseases. So for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, etc., or even the psychogenic 
um, related to these states are the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to discontinue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you know, you need to treat the underlying cause, but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause, then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, if your patient has hypogonadism, you need to give testosterone replacement. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone. So the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now, it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide, um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend hint, hint, star, star to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic ther therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we want to treat any underlying diseases. So, for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, etc., or even the psychogenic um, related to these states or the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to discontinue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you know, you need to treat the underlying cause, but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause, then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, if your patient has hypogonadism, you need to give testosterone replacement. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone. So those include sildenafil or Viagra, Tadalafil or Cialis, Vardenafil, um, also known as Levitra or Staxin, depending on which formulation you have. Staxin is the um, ODT formulation, um, and Avanafil or Stendra. The reason why the ones that are bolded here are bolded is because these are the ones that are most commonly seen in clinical practice, and those are going to be the ones for testing purposes that I'm going to expect you to know. Um, now, obviously, I want you to still know that Avanafil is used for erectile dysfunction, but you don't need to necessarily know its brand name of Stendra. And I'll be honest, I haven't actually seen this actual drug in practice, but it does exist. Um, the PDE5 inhibitors are competitive reversal inhibitors of phosphodiesterase isoenzyme 5, and these are found, um, this isoenzyme is found in the genital tissue. Um, these agents are effective for about 60 to 70 percent of patients overall. Um, adverse effects of this class in general include headache, facial flushing, dyspepsia, nasal congestion, dizziness, hypotension, and priapism, which is essentially a prolong prolonged erection, although that is very rare. Um, an important point to make here, hint, hint, star, star, is that um, a contraindication to phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors is organic nitrate, so things such as nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, um, and also isosorbide formulations that can be taken for angina or heart failure, like isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. Um, if you do have a patient um, 
who is administered a PDE5 inhibitor or takes a PDE5 inhibitor, it's very important that we hold those nitrates for at least 24 hours after giving the PDE5 inhibitor. And the exception for this is Tadalafil or Cialis. We need to wait at least 48 hours after we give Tadalafil. And the reason why we hold um, nitrates for these patients is because of risk of hypotension concomitantly, because as you see, these agents are antihypertensive agents. And PDE5 inhibitors can cause hypotension, which um, can be potentially um, deadly for a patient and require a hospital admission. Um, in regards to the comparison of all these different agents, the bolded information is the information that I want you to focus on. Um, so I want you to focus on the starting doses. Usually um, it is, advised to start low um, or on the lower end of the dosing range and go slow um, with these agents because obviously of the risk of side effects, particularly hypotension. Um, so with Viagra or Sildenafil, the starting dose is 25 to 50. For Tadalafil, it's 5 to 10. And for Vardenafil or Levitra, it is 10 milligrams um, typically. Though you could also go and start with um, 5 with Vardenafil as well, and that's not included on this slide, um, but that would be perfectly acceptable. Um, you see the doses ranges here. Typically for most of these agents, you're going to probably take them between 30 minutes and one hour prior to intercourse. The duration of um, therapy of these agents ranges, and it's very important to note here. For sildenafil and vardenafil, they last about two to five hours or two to four hours, depending on which agent you have. Um, but however, for tadalafil, it can actually last up to 36 hours. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the patient has an erection for 36 hours. I wanna be very clear about that. Um, it doesn't mean that the patient is erect that whole period of time. It means that they have the capability of becoming erect during that time. So for Cialis, for example, Cialis might be a good agent if the patient just wants to take one tablet. And something I did not include in the slides is that you want to also consider cost with these medications. A lot of these medications are not covered by insurance for the purpose of erectile dysfunction and as a result of that are very expensive um, with some agents you know costing as much as 50 to 80 dollars a tablet. Um, Cialis and Viagra I believe now cost in the ballpark probably of 20 to 30 dollars a tablet um, so with Cialis specifically, because it can work up to 36 hours, um, it may be beneficial for patients who are maybe going like on a weekend trip, for example, and they only want to take one tablet um, if they plan on having intercourse. Um, in that case, they might be able to potentially um, develop multiple erections with just one tablet. Um, it's also important to be aware about whether to take food on or food with these medications. With Cialis, it's not necessary. Um, with Sildenafil and Vardenafil, however, these should be taken on an empty stomach um, to promote absorption and overall action of the medication. So the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend hint, hint, star, star to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic thera therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we want to treat any underlying diseases. So for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, etc., or even the psychogenic 
um, related to these states or the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to discontinue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you know, you need to treat the underlying cause, but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause, then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, if your patient has hypogonadism, you need to give testosterone replacement. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone. A vacuum erection device is a non-invasive mechanical device, so it's essentially external. It doesn't go necessarily into the patient. It is a one-time purchase and can be used multiple times, and it contains two parts, a pump and a cylinder. The pump is the part that generates the negative vacuum pressure, and the cylinder is where the penis is inserted into one end, and the, the end of the cylinder is closed at the other end. The patient activates the pump to produce a vacuum pressure to draw arterial blood into the penis. And um, with that, erection can be prolonged by use of constriction bands or tension rings, which can be placed at the base of the penis or even drawn up the penis. Um, the initial onset, the first time these devices are used, is typically between 3 to 20 minutes. Um, however, as a patient gets used to the device and um, is able to um, operate the device properly and more efficiently, they can actually get an, um, an erection within about two to three minutes. Um, a flaw of this is that these devices are not discreet. So obviously, if a patient decides to develop an erection with these devices, their partner will most likely be aware of it um, because um, essentially, the partner will probably be in the room with them as they're using this device. Therefore, these devices are said to work best in older patients who are married um, or other patients um, of any age who are in stable relationships or are married um, and in committed monogamous relationships. Um, obviously, some adverse effects of a vacuum erec erection device is that a patient can develop penile pain, bruising, or injury because the device may actually cause this. But however, contraindications to this include sickle cell disease and history of prolonged erections. Um, with sickle cell disease, um, patients with sickle cell already have abnormally shaped hemoglobin. And because of that, blood flow may be altered in this patient, in these patients. And the sickle cell patients in general are more um, at risk for developing preoprism or prolonged erection. So if you if you use a vacuum erection device in these patients, it may be difficult um, to reverse um, the erection on its own, and the patient actually may have to go into the emergency room to get the erection reversed medically. A vacuum erection device is a non-invasive mechanical device, so it's essentially external. It doesn't go necessarily into the patient. It is a one-time purchase and can be used multiple times, and it contains two parts, a pump and a cylinder. The pump is the part that generates the negative vacuum pressure, and the cylinder is where the penis is inserted into one end, and the, the end of the cylinder is closed at the other end. The patient activates the pump to produce a vacuum pressure to draw arterial blood into the penis. And um, with that, erection can be prolonged by use of constriction bands or tension rings, which can be placed at the base of the penis or even drawn up the penis. Um, the initial onset, the first time these devices are used, is typically between 3 to 20 minutes. Um, however, as a patient gets used to the device and um, is able to um, operate the device properly and more efficiently, they can actually get an, um, an erection within about two to three minutes. Um, a flaw of this is that these devices are not discreet. So obviously, if a patient decides to develop an erection with these devices, their partner will most likely be aware of it um, because um, essentially, the partner will probably be in the room with them as they're using this device. Therefore, these devices are said to work best in older patients who are married 
um, or other patients um, of any age who are in stable relationships or are married um, and, and committed monogamous relationships. Um, obviously, some adverse effects of a vacuum erec erection devices that a patient can develop penile pain, bruising, or injury because the device may actually cause this. But however, contraindications to this include sickle cell disease and history of prolonged erections. Um, with sickle cell disease, um, patients with sickle cell already have abnormally shaped hemoglobin. And because of that, blood flow may be altered in this patient, in these patients. And the sickle cell patients in general are more um, at risk for developing preoprism or prolonged erection. So if you if you use a vacuum erection device in these patients, it may be difficult um, to reverse um, the erection on its own, and the patient actually may have to go into the emergency room to get the erection reversed medically. So the one thing I want you to focus on during this presentation is this schematic from DePiro, um, your textbook. And this will essentially tell you um, how you go about treating patients. Now, it is obviously not all encompassing of all of the agents that we just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but it does cover most of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents that we have there. And we will discuss the exceptions as well to this schematic. But for your testing purposes, I would highly recommend hint, hint, star, star to know this schematic. Um, the first thing that you want to do in the treatment of patients with erectile dysfunction is you want to treat any underlying diseases or any other cause of the erectile dysfunction that you can identify. If we can um, avoid using um, a pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic ther therapy directly to treat a patient such that you see in the lower half of the schematic, we're going to minimize that. Um, so we want to treat any underlying diseases. So for example, hypertension, if their hypertension is very uncontrolled, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, or even the psychogenic um, related to these states or the mental health disorders that they may have, like performance anxiety, for example. Um, we want to discontinue any medications that can contribute. So it's very important to be aware of those medications that can contribute to erectile dysfunction that we mentioned. Remove all risk factors if possible. Now, sometimes it may not be possible to remove the risk factor, for example, of peripheral vascular disease. If you have peripheral vascular disease, it's there. Um, you can treat it, but you can't necessarily reverse it completely. So you must keep in mind that you, know, you need to treat the underlying cause, but if you can't fully treat the underlying cause, then you may need to jump to drug therapy or non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, if your patient has hypogonadism, you need to give testosterone replacement. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit more whenever we actually um, talk about testosterone. Here are the references for this talk. And back to our case of BD. So our Caucasian male, 45 years old, who was concerned about his sexual performance. He's been dating his current partner for three months, has no problems with libido, uh, cannot become erect for sexual activity. Um, he has no past medical history and his vital signs are stable. So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, I did say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, patients still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, I did say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, patients still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that, because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. 
So what should be ascertained when interviewing BD about his erectile dysfunction? The answer is all of the above. So we need to inquire about any alcohol use or any other risk factors, um, such as smoking as well, as well as whatever his current medications are. Now, I did say he does have no past medical history, though um, even if you don't have a past med any past medical history, the patient still may be taking medications, and we always need to check for that, because medications may actually be a reason why we have a patient with erectile dysfunction. Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm an assistant professor of clinical sciences at Keck Graduate Institute, and today we will be discussing erectile dysfunction. The reason we're discussing this topic today is because erectile dysfunction affects many male patients, particularly those of older age. And when a patient develops erectile dysfunction, it can affect not only their love lives and um, sexual well-being, um, but it can affect their overall mentality and overall well-being as well.